Welcome to the Game of Impossible podcast. My name is Leon and this is my dad, Idris Jala. I am a marketer turned pastor and my father, well, he is a former minister as well as the chairman of a consulting firm as well as two uh, publicly listed companies. You are invited along our weekly check-in. Uh, this is a father-son podcast where we discuss all things transformation through the lens of business, leadership, sport and faith as well. Last week, we talked about a discipline of action, and today we're going to talk about situational leadership. Uh, it's one of your six secrets of transformation, and I believe it's something that's been very pivotal uh, for the both of us in terms of how we have approached leadership and leading our teams. So, you know, I think maybe we can start by talking about the, the, the genesis of this idea for the both of us. Situational leadership is, is a framework or model that we have borrowed. The key ethos of this is being flexible in our leadership to move from a more directive form of leadership towards a more empowering form of leadership. And these are all determined by the level of competencies uh, within our teams. The lower the level of competency, you have a higher level of control, whereas the higher the competency, the lower the level of control, where you become a bit more empowering in your style of leadership. Dad, can you tell us a bit about how this has worked out for you in your contexts? I have been really inspired by Ken Blanchard. And he was the first guy that introduced the idea of situational leadership. And he defined it in, in four phases, exactly like the way he described it, but he put it in, in phase one. So when I started any turnaround work, either in Shell Middle Distillates or in Malaysia Alliance or in also Shell Sri Lanka, it's called phase one. At the beginning of the phase one, the leadership style has to be very directive, meaning to say that I, as, as the leader of the organization, need to have a very clear idea in my mind where promised land is, where we're going. And I need to have a really good idea about what is the true north that defines the things that we need to do. But I do need to bring people along with me, but to make sure that there is enough people that say this is the way to go. We we'll modify to get some buy-in, but not to the point that we're going to get everybody buying in. At any start of the journey, the reason why the phase one is a directive style is that you try to explain to people what you're doing so that they understand the logic behind it. It's not always that they will all buy into it. But if you want to wait until everybody buys into it, you'll never even begin the journey. So the idea here is that, as you quoted Marty Linsky, I lecture at Harvard uh, together with him since uh, four year, five years now. And he says that at the start of the journey, when you are directing people to do a certain things, he said transformational leadership is about disappointing people at the rate they can absorb. That means to say that if they can understand, but they're not going to clap hands. So when I start my journey, let's say I stepped into Malaysia Alliance in, uh, in 1st December 2005. I told them we were going to achieve this target, break even the first year, second year and the third year and the fourth year we must achieve record profits. But we have to do it by making sure that we get rid of you know, 3,000 people. And we must sell the building in order to raise money in order to pay for redundancies because I don't want anybody to be forcibly redundant. You could see the resistance coming out from there. The union was first to jump but I then had the opportunity to explain to them why we needed to do it. I told them, I showed them the books that we had money lasting us between two months to three months. And if we don't make the changes in two to three months, we run out of cash. And so they understood why we needed to do it. Then they needed to ask me, are you going to make anybody redundant? I said, no. The way in which we will deal with the resistance was sell the building, 430 million, use that money to then get people who volunteer to leave. So I told the union president that then nobody is possibly redundant. So then they understood what we needed to do. But still, there were resistance from folks that saying that if we reduce the jobs by 3,000, 3,000 people go, what are we going to do with the task? Because the task is now going to be left people who stay. 
the stayers are very concerned about the levers moving because they have to do their, continue to do their job at the same time pick the additional job that are there. But you know, I always believe at the start of the journey, you will always have three types of people. Those who are really wanting to run with it, I call them the crusaders or, or, or the proponents of change. And then the folks that are resisting it, completely do, they don't want the change. They will tell you outright they don't want to resist it. But there is a third group called the, those on the fence. And they are just waiting to see how things are moving. So I spend most of my time in phase one, focusing on the crusaders and the believers or the proponents of change, the first group. And I, I only explain it to get the group two and three to understand why we need to do it. But I'm not going to spend time to convince them before the journey. So the style is very directive. Now, when we move into the phase two, at a time when we really had to remove 3,000 people in Malaysia Airlines, and the stayers have to pick up the jobs, that's the phase that is called the dissatisfaction phase. So the first phase called orientation phase, the second phase, dissatisfaction. And people are not satisfied. They're not happy with me. Because they said, well, you know, we were very good before. We were very happy here. But then you came and put all these things. But it's important to recognize that the role of leadership, while you continue to be directive in style, but you now must show empathy. You really need to show empathy. You really need to go and spend time talking to people, showing to them that you care, you understand their problem, but you have no choice. When I sold the building, there were a lot of resistance because there are folks that bought their houses somewhere in Ampang, closer to the, the city area. But when we sold the building, they were complaining that they had now to, look, to leave their homes in Ampang every morning, drive all the way to Subang, where our new office is going to be held, near the hangar. And there was a lot of resistance to that. But when I was handling this, I needed to show empathy, talk to them and really explain nicely to them why we needed to do this. People understand why we needed to do it, but showing empathy is a very important part of leadership. And the second part of what you do in the stage called the dissatisfaction stage. You do every difficult stuff that you intend to do it quick. Don't drag it on. So if you want to do redundancy, don't drag that exercise for six months. Do it in one month. And the reason is this. You know, Leon, you know about me medical doctors when they do a surgery. Nobody is going to put a patient on the, the table there and say, I'm going to cut you for the next one week. They will do it in an hour or two. Because that period is the pain period, so you, want, you don't want to prolong the pain period. So almost people say, why are you in a hurry to do this? My attitude is that because this is called a dissatisfaction phase, I know during the period, very little work is done. A lot of people are demoralized. There is a lot of people talking negative in the organization about the changes that's going to take place. So you don't want that to go on for very long. So if you do it, do it fast and quick. Even if you make mistakes, it's okay. You make mistakes that's tolerable. So that's the phase two. The phase three, when all of that is sorted out and they get some early quick wins, the first folks that will begin to jump and join the, the proponents of change is the third group. Many in the third group are the fence sitters. Then they realize, wow, the result is really there. I can see that we're making big progress. Now they begin to join the first group. So the, sec the first group becomes larger because the middle group is start to join them. But the second group, which is the resistance, they're not going to change at that point. So what you then do is focus on the first group, which is the, in the third group that has joined them. You then try to get them to begin to resolve many of the issues of the day, the resolving the, the problems. It's called the resolution phase. In the resolution phase, because as you mentioned before, the level of control becomes less when the competence is high. In this case, as a leadership, in leadership, I would need to reduce my, my control. That means I delegate more to them. So phase three and phase four is empowerment. The starting point for empowerment is the phase three. So when do you know the right time to shift gear from being directive to empowering? It is when you judge the level of competencies. That means the team development 
has reached a level that they know what to do, how to resolve the problem. It's called a resolution phase. And that is when you begin to let go, learn to let them go, but define the objectives, the things you want them to do, and the constraints and parameters where you say, you to do this, these are areas thou shall not do. And once they're clear about it, everything outside you can do. So I think you can do that. The last phase is the best part. It's called the production phase. The production phase is when they really know what to do. They can even change the, the key parameters, your priorities, because they think that the old priorities are no longer required. We have better things to do and we will do this. And they get very good results. Then you know a lot of people in the organization have really embraced the change. Their competency level have reached a level that they are solidly be behind it, they can do it. Then you really learn to be become a coach. The leadership style is more like a coach. You don't play football. You tell them what to do during the game, prior to the game, but you are not on the field. They are out there doing it. So you are becoming more like a cheerleader, more encouraging them. So in that case, when we did in Malaysia Align, the application was, I was there for three years and eight months. The first year, I was really heavily involved in uh, phase one and phase two and a little bit already of phase three. And so, and from then on, because we broke even already in phase two and we were really making record profits, I could see there's a lot of competency that many of them have, have embraced. So I love that part. It is that part that I then identified my successor in uh, Tengku Azmil, that he was the guy that will take over from me when I go. And so I spent a lot of time with him. So everything that we were doing, I got him involved every step along the way so that he's very familiar with the things that we do so that there's seamless uh, transition. In the same way, when I was in Shell Middle Distillates, we did exactly the same thing. And we got one Dutchman who, uh, who came from Holland. He took over from me and he, the handing over was fantastic. It's really great to see uh, these people stepping up uh, to get on to do the job. The key lever really is is the level of competency yeah. uh, within your teams. Can you share if there were um, structures that you put in place? And if so, what were those structures in place for you to very objectively gauge um, the level of competency? Because I think sometimes the challenge can be you when you're very close to a project, especially if you're leading it, and let's say your default style is you are a bit more directive, you have a bit more of a tendency to want to control the outcome. Sometimes it can be, I have personally found that because I have that bias, even if the teams start to actually show a, a level of competency where they are ready, um, if your natural default is to want to hold things tightly, sometimes it can be quite difficult to know when to let go unless you've already mapped up what are the key metrics uh, right. to, to consider to show you that the team is uh, at that level of competency? So what, has, what have those uh, been for you? There are two. The ones I mentioned last week, we referred to the discipline of action when I said we have every week we have a monitoring system on Friday and then the following week we get into problem solving. This mechanism, it really allows you to observe how people are whether the level of competency is solving the problem is really up to the mark. So you can observe them every week during the problem solving session. And if they are struggling with it, you will see it during the week. So if you can see a lot of progress during the week, that's the first mechanism, the problem solving, the weekly monitoring. And then the, the second aspect is the appraisal. We have twice a year, mid-year appraisal, and then the end of the year, that's another appraisal. In that exercise, that's when the supervisor and the employee sit down and discuss all the things that were being observed during the monthly, the, the weekly monitoring system and the problem solving system. They culminate in a discussion that takes place twice a year, mid-year and end of the year. And that corrective action can then be made. So if the person needs learning on even simple things like how to do spreadsheets, to make analysis properly, then that person will have to go to courses on how to do that and to make sure they understand. If someone does not quite understand the makeup of profit and loss statement, then we get that person to really go for a course 
on how to understand the PNL, the profit and loss statement. And that is very specific. And those are the training needs analysis done during the twice a year appraisal. And that's the training needs analysis is done. And then the identification of the training that is required that's given. I really like on the job training. Many of the things that I do in Shell, in Malaysia Alliance, in the government, I really encourage people to go for on the job training. Let's suppose we say Mr. A has struggled with uh, spreadsheets and understanding the profit and loss statement. And I know that B, Miss B is our high flyer in that area. When we have a project with another client, I make sure that Mr. A and Miss B are working together on the project doing precisely the PNL. And in no time, I would say one month, that person who does not know how to do it, he walk away with full confidence because not only would that person understand the theory, but actually know how to apply it because they've done it in real practice. So our experience is uh, very much pairing people who are good in a particular thing with someone that is learning on the job. And so, of course, there's always room for classroom training where the theory is being taught so that people understand fully. But I do believe that experience, experiential learning has tremendous value. Yeah. And there's a, there's a science to why that is the case. So, you know, there's been a lot of... Um, there's been a lot of study into the area of neuroplasticity. Uh, and neuroplasticity, it just means uh, this notion that actually nothing in our makeup is entirely hardwired. I think in the past, you've heard a lot of language of people saying, oh, I, I, I do things like this or I think like this because it's hardwired in me. Um, but these studies on neuroplasticity, mm. they suggest that actually your neural pathways can actually be completely rewired based on things that you orient your mind into. You know? So if you have a belief that you want to become a certain type of person, if you truly believe in that, naturally that will start to create uh, biases. Uh, we, some people might call it confirmation bias, but actually there is a science. Your, you, your neural pathways actually get uh, reactivated or, or, or redirected. So I, mean, it, I, I started thinking about that because your point about uh, learning by doing, I think why that is so effective is because there is no better way for you to truly experience something than by doing it. And I think we were having a discussion the other day as well about how actually, you know, it's, I always believe in starting from the being, who do you want to become first? And then thinking about, okay, what are the actions required to become that type of person? Um, but that does not discount the fact that actually the doing is very important because if you only think about the being uh, and you don't move into the, the doing, the doing is essentially what so then solidifies that, that being that you, that you want to attach yourself to. So by doing the work, by quickly getting people into, you would call it the baptism by fire, um, learning on the job, uh, it really enlivens that experience uh, for the person. And I think as that happens, it further strengthens those, uh, th those cognitive biases that will start to spur us towards being the type of person uh, that we intend to become through that pursuit. I mean, the whole premise of situational leadership is being flexible, knowing when to, when to shift gears. But surely everyone has, a, has a, a certain default setting. What would you say is your default? My default setting is I'm more directive than empowering. So I really struggle to make the shift. But because I understand that I have to do it and I have to work hard to do the default. And this is how I actually learn how to do it. And I get a piece of paper. I write on that piece of paper precisely the objective that I want my team members whom I want to empower to. And then I say, this is what I want you to do. And then I would say, these are the trade-offs. And to achieve this, I know that you're going to make a trade-off between this area and that area. That means I would, you do more of this. If you do more of this, you have to do less of this. So that's the trade-off area. And then the last thing I'll put on the sheet are the constraints. And I will tell that person, these are the things you cannot do. For example, the constraints as I give you six million budget to do the task. But I don't want you to go bust on the six million. 
you can do all the things to do you can adjust how much you put for this so the trade-off is if i want to do this i want to maximize my profit but i also want to make sure that there's revenue growth so the trade-off is between the two if you want to put a lot of revenue growth you might reduce the profitability and so I will tell, tell him, I know you're going to do a trade-off between profitability and revenue growth, but I, you cannot go bust on the six million budget that I'm giving you. So when I do that, I then have a discussion between that person that I want to empower. If the person is on exactly the same page in that discussion along, along those three things that we discussed before, the objective, the trade-off, and the constraints, and we're on the same page, I then I feel confident that I can empower him. I will tell him, I'm not interested to know how you're going to do it, but I want to see that you achieve the results. We still have, we still have the monitoring on a weekly basis, see the results is there. And as far as what are the activities you're going to do, that's down to you. And so I think when you start doing that, it allowed me to move away from a default setting. Because the default setting was, if I don't have a structure like that, my default setting must always be, I want to look over here, the, the guy's shoulder, and I want to tell him how to do it best. But if you start doing that, you will never let the person learn, discover for himself or herself, what is the best way to do it. So in the end, they will always refer to you. But if you tell them, this is all I expect from you, and these are the areas I don't want you to do under the constraints, you will find that they really rise to it. I have... Uh I find for me, I tend to have a different default setting depending on context. So typically in a work context, I think I, um, I, I have tended to be a bit more uh, directive mm. uh, in, in my, my leadership style. That tends to be my default. But then interestingly, I find that in other areas, uh, so let's say it's, it's, in, it's at home, uh, somehow my default in a home setting, uh, you know, if... Andrea, uh, my wife, and I are planning uh, projects to do. Like, for example, right now, we're looking at how do we, um, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, renovating our home. Uh, in those projects, strangely enough, I have a very different approach. Uh, my, I tend to default to being more uh, empowering uh, and a bit more facilitative. I wonder for you, do you have, uh, is, is, there, is there a difference at home and in the things that you're doing? You're on sabbatical right yeah. now, and so you have other projects that you are also yeah. working on with mom. Yeah, I think that at home, I always say mom is, is the home minister. She's in charge of the home. But of course, there are certain things I like to do and I want to do it. The, the classic one, when we build this house, it was a real challenge. It was the first time that she and I decided to really work from ground zero to build a house. There's a lot of debate that we had internally between ourselves about what are the things we needed to do? So when we built the house, we kind of, we didn't quite decide to do it that way. As it turned out, I allowed her to do everything that she was empowered to do, everything to do with the interior decor. But the structures of the house, is, as it turned out, I was the one that called the shots on the structures of the house, the main design of the house, the main design. But the design, of course, the artistic thing, we did it together. But the structures, uh, the structural side was, I tended to be the one calling the shots. But anything to do with the inside of the house, what I'm going to put, how we're going to furnish it, I think mom has uh, authority over that one. So as we discuss this, and I call these polarities, there are things that, uh, that exist between husband and wife that are not problem to be solved, but they are polarities to be managed. We were just talking about leaving the house on time. <laughs> Literally, while I was setting up the cameras, we were talking about <laughs> <laughs> that polarity to be yeah. managed. Yeah, exactly. So I think that is always, uh, we'll talk about that another time, but not, <laughs> not today. But today, that's the, the question. We, we will get to this idea uh, later, subsequent session when we talk problem to be solved and polarity to be managed. That's a very interesting concept. But for now, I return back to the situational leadership. In the situational leadership, I really think it's a grave error amongst leadership. I would consider it's a fatal mistake of leadership when they are not ambidextrous. Meaning to say that they can't play the game of being directive at the same time, being able to change, shift gear towards more empowering. But when people are just single-minded in their approach, 
not ambidextrous, then I think they are really unable to cope with the situation when the team development changes from being lacking in competencies to becoming very competent. And this is the area where I believe there's a very big error in leadership, being unable to make that, that shift. And I also want to mention this. There are a lot of people that believe that they will make the shift based on their own whims and fancies. That is not the way to do it. You make the shift from directive style to empowering style only on the basis of the team development, not on your whims and fancies when you decide to do it. You got to look and assess at the level of competencies of your team. And if the team has reached the level when you think that they are able to deliver the results with a lot of empowerment and with the constraints clearly laid out for them, then you learn to let go. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, you know, I think one of the keys actually to doing this is to be very, very transparent um, about what those measures of competency are, both with your management, but then also with the teams that are under your care. Um, and I have found that particularly helpful uh, with the team uh, that I take care of and what we do. And this is not this is not by my design, but it's just by virtue of the, the structures that are already in place. Uh, we talked about it in the previous week's um, episode, but it's the fact that we have these weekly check-ins. Um, and what we always encourage is whenever we do goal setting, these are not goals that we set and then we only revisit uh, at the end of the year when we do our appraisal. They become the premise for us to have our weekly check-in because in any sort of, when we ask the question of where are you winning, um, those will always be in the context of some of those bigger goals that we have set in place. And so because we do that on a regular basis, it means that you're able to consistently track the progress of, let's say, a team member. But it also is for the team member a way to hold you accountable as the manager um, to be reminded that, hey, these were goals that we talked about and you know we're talking about them regularly, which means you have clear optics on the progress. So you essentially have no excuse to mm. say, oh, we have not really been looking at that because we talk about it now every week. So that holds you very accountable as well to ensure that you know we, we, we make sure we we you know we, we, we get things done and, and that you are ultimately remunerated or rewarded accordingly if those goals um, are met because we talk about it on a weekly and or regular basis. So I think communication um, is really key. But also as as we communicate that I find that that also what I found helpful for me is it has helped me to reframe my entire mode of working. You know, I have often been one that puts a lot of pride in what I can do and how I can do the work. And I often struggled with changing that to being how can I raise people up who will be able to not only do it at my level, but actually do an even better job than me. How do I essentially make myself redundant, which is which is the premise of, of situational leadership anyway, you want to move towards that direction. But I think when you also then use this as a basis to constantly communicate to your management or your leadership, that also further solidifies your identity as a facilitator or enabler um, for those things to happen, like, to be that coach and that champion for these people. You know, Leon in the Bible, Moses and the Exodus is a very good example of of situational leadership and how he dealt with the team. Maybe as a pastor in the church, would you like to comment on your observation about Moses and how he led his people? Yeah, I mean, the biggest one, without going into a lot of detail, at its most basic level, I think what, what I'm often uh, encouraged by is ultimately, despite those 40 years in the wilderness, ultimately, Moses wasn't the one to bring people to the promised land. It was, it was Joshua, his mm. successor. And I used to struggle with that because I think, well, I've put in so much work. How come I don't get recognized <laughs> for doing it? Or I don't get to uh, you know, enjoy the thrill of arriving at the destination. But as, you know, as I continue to read the story of Moses, um, I feel like the story won't be as impactful if he had done it because that would be almost too obvious. It would be too obvious a narrative, you know. This guy led his team to a destination. They got there, the end. I think it's far more impactful and counter-cultural, actually, that he did all of this. There were so many challenges, and yet he paved the way for someone else, Absolutely. someone younger. 
Uh, many years ago, Leon, I was, uh, my team and I in Pamandu Associates, we were invited by President Kikwete. He's a president of Tanzania. And so he said, uh, Idris, I want you and your team to come and help me do the economic and social transformation in my country in my final year. Because in Tanzania, a president can only last constitutionally for 10 years. So he's finished the first year. He said, there are a lot of lessons learned what I really should have done differently. I want to now do it in my final five years. So when we had this conversation, he understood the idea of situational leadership. We told him that you have to display <coughs> directive style in the beginning and eventually begin to hand over, and let go of the job. And so in the beginning, we had our first workshop and he announced to the whole cabinet that we must agree the true north. We must agree the six priorities. So they all agreed the priorities. There were six. And so he was actually outvoted. He wanted one area called health care to be one of those, but he lost in a democratic process. But he allowed that to go. But three months later, he inserted it. He took an approach that said, I'm still the president. I want us to include this. And we have the money and resources to do that. So. We ran the lab for six weeks, very directive. So in the first two months, we've already finished the roadmap and the town hall, open day for everybody. We had it shown on live television where the country was going and what the priorities were. And then we started then to do the monthly, the weekly uh, dashboard and the, the monthly problem solving exercises. And then he was then able to see how the team were developing he had one guy who was doing the delivery work, equivalent of Pamandu, his name is Omari Isa. Omari then helped him to go and do it. So Omari and the team were assessing the competencies of the people within the government that was able to deliver it on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. And there is also a, an annual report card about what's been delivered and not delivered. So how they do it subsequent years. They were made a lot of progress, I would say. I would make one particular comment, uh, which is similar. We had rural infrastructure development in our government transformation program in Malaysia. They also had their rural development program, which was very similar about giving water to rural people that didn't have clean and treated water. When I look at one year of implementation versus their one year of implementation, they did the results was three times more than our results. When I looked at the reasons why they were able to produce bigger results than our results, was three times more than our results, was because at that point in time, President Kikwete was very quick to take a directive action on providing enough resources, money and materials for this because it's high priority. And there was a lot of arguments that we should put money elsewhere, but he put his foot down. He was also the finance uh, minister, making sure that there's money and budget allocated for doing this and resources. And so that's one. And the other reason was he put in people that were very passionate about the work that's being done. And the level of competency rose very rapidly. Within the first two to three months, I could sense the team that was running with rural, rural development, in particular giving treated and clean water to rural people, their competence level was rising far above all the other programs that we're leading in, 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 uh, in Tanzania. So you could see, I could watch how President Kekwete and Omari, they were beginning to learn to let go on that particular area because the team that was running the water program was already competent at running it, so they were letting go. Really, I'm very happy with that work. And I, to me, President Kikwete was a classic embodiment of someone who understood how to exercise directive style and shifting gear towards an empowering style. Have you experienced the follies of not being adaptable? Maybe in your past, before you had really um, become very intentional about exercising situational leadership. You were saying that your default setting um, is perhaps more of a directive one. Maybe in your younger days, earlier parts of, of your career, have there, looking back, been examples of where only sticking to one style um, did not yield the results that you had intended? If I look back at the uh, 
my experience we had. There was a time that we were involved in in retail in Malaysia. While there were a lot of views and discussions about what we needed to do to grow the business. And we didn't take a very strong directive style on how important that priority was. And so a lot of lip service was given to it. That means expanding the number of retail petrol stations we have in Malaysia. But we didn't put impossible targets and we didn't place them down. If we were to say, well, in the next five years, we want to grow the number of retail stations from 1,000 to 5,000, we would have been make, able to make tremendous progress. But as far as we were concerned, we just wanted to cruise along. Mm. Why was so, that? And because we didn't take a, a, a directive style. So I think in the beginning, it was very much, there was no True North associated with it. Even when you put True North, the game the impossible, you need to have some level of directive style because nobody want to increase your target by two times or three times within a short period of time. So in that period, in my early years, when I was national sales manager for Shell's petrol station in Malaysia, we didn't put a very impossible target. So in no time, in 10 years, Petronas was a new kid on the block. They overtook us. When Petronas started, they had very few retail stores in the country. They were lower than, less, less than uh, Exxon less than Caltex, less in Malaysia, with a shell. But in, in 15 years, they overtook everybody. Simply because I think the, the leadership, Hassan Marikan and the team, they decided that they were going to grow it and they understood the idea of uh, putting forward a game, the impossible, and therefore pitching that. And not only that, putting resources onto it. In what I call robbing Peter to pay Paul take money from one area to, which is less priority and put in the area that's high priority and then exercise situational leadership when, when the team starts to develop and learning to let go. I was watching them at the time. I was not the general manager for retail. And I think if I look back at the time, if we took a directive approach in the beginning and then the folks in my team would have been able to run with it and we didn't exercise the game, the impossible. So I think on hindsight, if I look back over the 20-year period of looking back, that is the folly of not being able to adjust from being directing into empowering. But I think we were doing a lot more empowering. If you're going into uncharted territory, it's actually, I think sometimes, maybe some people feel, I, I, I at times have struggled with this as well, early, my very early stages of my career, where I thought being assertive, would be misread as being bossy or, or being pushy. But actually in the context of if you're wanting to do something that is new, if you're wanting to pioneer something, mm -hmm. the natural feeling for a lot of your teams would be perhaps one of fear or, or, or maybe concern because it's, it, it's unknown and uh, you know definitely that would entail a bit of extra work. So why would we want to do this extra work? How do we know it's, uh, it's going to be worthwhile? And at that early stage, I think, I guess there is a need for whoever is leading the charge to be directive, not just because, you know, you just want to tell people what to do. But ultimately, I think people sense charisma. Mm. Charisma and magnetism, I feel, are actually very important components of leadership. You can be, you can have a very clear game plan and still be very directive in terms of, you know, I've, this, I, we, you know, we are going to map out exactly how we're going to do this. But if you don't have a sense of conviction or charisma, then it's also actually very difficult to uh, convince your teams to follow you because, you know, we, we operate both on logic, but also emotion. So, you know, as a leader, we also have to be able to get, ensure that we're engaging our teams on both levels. Um, and so I have realized that you can actually be directive and yet even in that very directive phase, still be encouraging, still be empathetic, still be uh, empowering in your general being, in the general day-to-day -day because your interactions with your team are not just limited to the project, but there are 101 other types of interactions, interpersonal interactions that happen um, and as well as that, not just directly between you and your team members, but your team members see how you interact uh, and deal with other people on other projects as well. And so this might be a contested uh, opinion, but I have, 
I, I personally feel that this is why I struggled with um I, I struggled with the past three years of being hundred of working hundred percent remotely. Because I felt that when we took away uh, that kind of day-to-day -day office interaction, you now lose your teams lose sight of a, a different facet of you, where you're only most of your interactions are limited to just going through the agenda, going through your work items. Um, it became harder then to make sure that if you are in the directive phase, how do you also show those other that other side? Um, so how we have tried to um, work around that is through through the weekly check-ins, you know, making sure that we ensure there is a how are you portion to it as well. Um, but that can only do so much. I still feel like the best level of, the best way to gain a level of uh, proximity to, to a person or to a team is actually by being there um, in person. And so that's just been something that I have been thinking about because naturally, uh, you know, things things are moving and there has been so much, uh, so much value actually in the fact that we have been able to adopt a lot more remote work um, and I don't want to be someone who holds on to the old way of doing things but I do believe that this is one area where you know if if you are in a circumstance where you have to work remotely then I think you have to be very intentional about trying to find those ways to to simulate those sorts of interactions uh, even remotely what, what are your thoughts on I, that? I agree with you when uh, Leon that when you want to shift from working in office to a virtual working you cannot just shift until you introduce a new way of working that comes along with it. A new way of working, and I really mean this seriously, supervisors must sit down and really think through what are the objectives you want the staff to do for the week, for the year, and for the month, and particularly for the week. What exactly is the task you want him or her to do? What is the expectation in terms of outcome? What are the areas of trade-off? and what are constraints that you are laying to that person during the week. And don't just send it out to that person. Say, this is what I want to send to you for you to focus on for the week. Do you have any comments before Monday begins? So that conversation needs to take place. And it's a very structured way of a dialogue between the supervisor. When you start that motion going, you will find the rhythm for how they will operate become set into a practice. But I would say, to, though, that you are right in saying that if you're just focusing on people virtual working, you, f you lose the element of connectivity, that people, the human side of team development. That's why in our, in our case, we do monthly checking in physical meeting. People do meet and to discuss things that are really necessary for that rather than online. We also have sessions, social sessions. We invite people to meet and have dinner together and chat about many things other than work as well. So I think bringing back that togetherness in the team is very important. Otherwise, it becomes so mechanical. But I will also tell them the beauty of virtual working is that we reduce our costs. In our case, I don't have an office, Leon. We got after the, during the pandemic, we permanently got rid of our offices. We only kept the meeting room. Nobody in Pamandu Associates have individual offices, and so we have only the admin people have an office. There are a few people that want to go and check in and do a bit of work and turn up, but we only have meeting rooms. But that cannot work, in my view, unless you introduce a new routine, new way of working. That means clear tasks that's given on a weekly basis, then I think it will work. And so, for what it's worth, I've now realized that in the time that we've been, since the pandemic, and we've doubled our revenue at half the cost. And so when I asked the team, how many of you will volunteer to return back to the old way of working? Nobody wanted that. Maybe a handful of 5%. Because the beauty of virtual working and the way we introduce it today, we tell people, during the day, do not feel guilty to go and send your kids to school, to go and uh, shop during the day. Don't feel guilty about watching a movie, going to the cinema. As long as you fulfill the task that was given for you during, for that week, we don't care how you do it. You, know, you don't feel guilty. So when people feel they don't have to feel guilty, you feel a sense of freedom that people have freedom to determine how they live their lives. 
And I, that's why when we put it back to the pole, very few people in Pamandu want to return to the old way of working. And so I think you can increase your productivity, at the same time increase the happiness of the people, they have the sense of freedom to live lives the way they should. But in my view, you cannot achieve both of that until and unless you introduce a very regimented, disciplined way of working that people have to have. And every week there's an assessment of whether the task is delivered and as for the rest, you empower them. The paradox here or the irony is actually that having very clear boundaries yeah. actually is very freeing for an organization. And even on, a, on an individual basis, you know, there's a... There's this, there's this story that Nicky Gumbel, uh, he shares, and he gives this example of a time where he was, uh, he, I think he was at a football game, and then so he had to step in uh, to referee the game. And what ensued was just utter chaos because he obviously was not uh, skilled as a referee. So there were all sorts of things happening. There were, you know, kids being injured. Um, and so he describes there being chaos because he was not providing uh, enough boundaries and ground rules. Then eventually, the other guy took over again uh, to referee the rest of the match. And the rest of the match was perfect. You know, everything ran smoothly. And so I've often found that uh, an interesting thought that actually when you have boundaries, but you're also very clear about those boundaries, the effect of it actually isn't one of being controlled or feeling hindered, but it actually becomes very freeing. As we both have our parents, you got two kids, and you know, I also have two kids, you and, and Max. It was important for me, to me and my wife, your mom, to know when we must allow you and, and Max to have a lot more empowerment. Because that's the only way you can grow. In the same way, in the corporate world, that's how we do it. You must learn to let go. And so every step along the way, I've always tried to find people that I feel are suited to do the job better than me. And then I then work towards making them grow into it. And I'm always reminded by this saying by John Ruskin. And this is a statement I will make directly to the, my future successor. And I will say to this, you know, the best reward for men's toil, this is what John Ruskin once said, is not what he gets from it, but what he becomes of it. And I do believe if you run with me and run this project and you grow, then you become the best version of yourself. That is the biggest reward you will get out from doing this. I think that's a great place to end the podcast this week. Uh, Dad, thanks for, for sharing on situational leadership. It's been, I think this is something that has been very, very key for both of us uh, in all that we do. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about winning coalitions. What, what, what do we mean by this? Can you give us a little glimpse or a taster as to what we can expect for next week? Basically, it comes from the notion that there is no man is an island. No woman is an island. And so it means that you have to bring people along with you, not just your team, but the board, the management team, your stakeholders, the public that's involved, the suppliers, everybody that's part of this enterprise. The way to succeed in an organization is the ability to garner the forces, the cooperation from all the parties involved so that they're all supporting the cause. It's almost like when you start the transformation journey, you think about it like a revolution. You, you burn some small bush fires inside there and then when those fires ignite, then the cause a huge conflagration that can then combust and create a revolution. That's how you then do it. So when we talk about winning coalition, it's really about bringing stakeholders to come together and then they align in pursuit of what you really want to chase. That's very good. Looking forward to it. Thank you for joining us and listening. We'll see you next week.